Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Denise Forstuber, Associate Director of the Future Europe Initiative at the Atlantic Council. We're glad to host today's event, the Central European Economic Policy Response to COVID-19 with our partners at Globsec. And we're thrilled to host such a diverse and engaging group of speakers with us today. But before I introduce our speakers, I need to note a few housekeeping remarks for everyone. First, we will be accepting audience questions at the end via Zoom's chat box, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. For those of you watching on live stream today, you can also comment on the Atlantic Council's Twitter live stream. When tweeting, be sure to use the hashtag StrongerWithAllies and coronavirus. And finally, today's event will run a little bit differently than some of our previous events. It'll be less like a traditional panel and more like a news broadcast. So we aim to keep everyone's remarks as concise as possible to ensure we get enough time for audience Q&A at the end. So enough housekeeping notes. Central and Eastern Europe have always been important pillars of our work at the Atlantic Council, particularly with the Future Europe Initiative. And we're here today to discuss this region in the context of a major new global challenge, the coronavirus pandemic. Today, joining us, we have several very distinguished speakers, including Piotr Trubinski, IMF Alternate Executive Director for Poland, among several other countries, Dr. Seilard Benk, IMF Alternate Executive Director for Hungary, Austria, Czech Republic, Kosovo, Slovakia, and Slovenia, among others, Vladislav Rashkovan, IMF Alternate Executive Director for Ukraine and Romania, among other countries, and John Sigur Gersen, IMF Alternate Executive Director for Denmark and the Baltics, among several other countries as well. But that's not it. We also have Sebastian Borduja, State Secretary in the Romanian Ministry of Public Finance. We have Ms. Eva Bartanova, Director of the Americas in the Czech Ministry of Industry and Trade. We have Sonia Muzikarova, Chief Economist at the Globsec Policy Institute. And we have Benjamin Haddad, Director of the Future Europe Initiative at the Atlantic Council. I'd now like to turn it over to Josh Lipsky, the Director of Programs and Policy at the Council's Global Business and Economics Program, to help provide some context for what this region is facing and what the implications might be on a broader scale. We're hoping to shed light on this pandemic and how it's affecting Central and Eastern Europe's economies, as well as how these countries are responding to try to mitigate the negative effects on their economies. Josh and his team have been important voices in this debate already, organizing critical content and events on the global economic impact of the pandemic. So we're delighted to have you kick us off, Josh, and turn it over to you. Great, well, thank you, Denise, and thank you everyone for joining today. And as Denise said, welcome to this virtual panel. And we're so pleased to co-host with the Atlantic Council's Future of Europe Initiative. As Denise said, I'm Josh Lipsky. I'm the Director of Programs and Policy for the Global and Business and Economics Program at the Atlantic Council. And I think you've seen from the Atlantic Council in the past few weeks, our fast reactions on the health and the geopolitical impacts. And we're also committed to continue to convene relevant discussions around the global economic crisis. Um, last week, from our end, we hosted a conversation with Jason Furman. Ben Haddad and I wrote an op-ed this week about Europe's need to unite in an economic crisis. And tomorrow we're gonna to host Carmen Reinhardt to talk about the impact of the crisis in emerging markets. And today we're here to talk about the impact in Central and Eastern Europe. And I am so pleased personally to see so many former IMF colleagues on the call. I feel like I'm back at the IMF now, just in a virtual meeting uh, with so many friends and former colleagues. And the focus today is important. Uh, we know that coronavirus will plunge the global economy into the second recession in a generation. And while Central and Eastern Europe still seem to be in the early stages of the outbreak, we only need to look to Italy, Spain, even right here in the US, and understand how severely this virus can disrupt economic activity. And of course, no matter the extent of the actual outbreak, Central Europe's future is inextricably linked to the rest of Europe and the world. We know that. We know that this region is more exposed to shocks than many others. And I think that's something we're gonna to discuss today. The truth is that over the past three decades, this region has been key to the rapid economic growth and it has dramatically raised its living standards. It's really a model for success around the world. Uh, but the region's success has in many ways translated into broader success of Europe. And that's a story that's not told often enough and we're committed to telling it here. 
We just need to think about what this region provides to Europe and to the rest of the world. We know automobile parts, of course. We know that Central Eastern Europe is really the engine that makes Europe and the world run. But it's not just that. It ranges from aerospace equipment. Think of computers. Think of smaller tech. Think of apparel. Think of shoes. Think of so many industries. And all these industries, if you think about them, they have a common theme, right? They rely on global supply chains and they rely on global demand. So two things that are just completely now under threat from the coronavirus crisis. So these economies that we're talking about today are hit especially hard by closed borders and frozen economic activity. So that's why I think the focus of this event is so important and timely. And we're seeing the economic consequences show up already, unfortunately. As my IMF friends know all too well, uh, we've already seen nine non-EU emerging economies in the region joining more than 70 other IMF member countries and asking for emergency assistance. And this is only in a matter of weeks. And just to put that in perspective a little, there before this crisis, there are 40, 40 IMF members with programs ongoing. Uh, so already to have 70, 80 coming to the IMF in a matter of weeks just shows you how quickly this is accelerating. That's true for the world and it's true for this region. Um, so the questions we want to answer today are what are the policy measures we need to take in the region to help keep households and business afloat, help them weather this crisis? What lessons does this hold for the rest of Europe? I think that's a really important question we should look at. And finally, do Central and Eastern European countries have the fiscal firepower and the access to credit markets they need to address the crisis? If not, how can we help them get there? So I'll close by quoting Vaclav Havel. My former boss, Christine Lagarde, quoted him at the ECB just a few months ago when she was speaking about this region. And that was before the crisis, but I think the words are even more appropriate now. And he said, it is in the moment of profound doubt that we can give birth to new certainties. And so I think we can think about that today. And looking at this panel, this virtual discussion, I think we have the right people here, despite the doubt, to hopefully provide some new certainties. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Denise, and thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And you raised some very important points that I hope we can continue to unpack in our discussion today. I'm now going to turn it over to our IMF colleagues to start to unpack that with us and help us better understand the landscape in Central and Eastern Europe. So Piotr, I'd like to start with you. You are alternate executive director at the IMF for Poland, among many other countries. What does the situation look like in Poland? What sectors will be impacted the most? Um, hello, Denise, and thank you all for uh, for organizing this meeting, but also for inviting us uh, for this uh, timely discussion. Uh, so, um, as uh, you, you see, there are a couple of colleagues from the IMF, and um, I'm in in this uh, fortunate situation that I represent only one country that that will be discussed today. So, I will try to be short and leave more space to to the colleagues that represent a couple of countries at the IMF executive board. So uh, uh, regarding Poland, it, it seems to be relatively resilient to the shock from the COVID-19 so far, comparing to many other emerging markets. Um, and that is due mostly to its diversified economy, which is driven by internal demand, moderate tourism sector. Um, moreover, uh, the flexible exchange rate, the current account balance that is cl uh, close to zero and relatively um, uh, relatively, I say, uh, big fiscal space and net energy importer status, they are all helpful in, in the current situation. Um, naturally, um, the impact of, of, of the virus weighs on Poland's GDP um, in 2020. We don't know much about uh, the projections for 2021. It's too early to say, uh, but so far the, the whole projection was revised from 3.3 to 1.8 percent and i think it might go further down as um, the impact will be more visible uh, in the coming weeks um, um, however for the 2021 uh, still the v-shape recovery is uh, expected um, um, and this outlook is of course subject to revisions as there are many downside risks surrounding the outlook um, um, 
especially as it comes to duration of the lockdown, but also as it, as it comes to the extent of the pandemics in the region. Uh, so, so far, the Polish government has introduced a policy mix to respond to the recession on the monetary policy front. The National Bank of Poland has cut rates by 50 basis points and reduce the required reserve ratio for banks to um, and also provided some additional liquidity. Um, on the fiscal side, the government has introduced the so-called antivirus shield program to fight with the economic impacts of COVID-19. So the authorities proposed uh, 66 billion uh, post lotus, which is um, around uh, 15 to 17 billion US dollars budgetary spending for um, and that that goes directly to the hospitals to, to buy equipment supplies uh, also as a wage subsidies increased guarantees additional loans for the smes and postponement of payment of social contributions and some deduction um, um and this comes to other measures uh, there is also some deduction of 2020 losses for 2021 tax settlement introduced so far um uh, and the government, as far as I'm concerned, uh, recently also proposed to to um, uh, uh, dedicate a public infrastructure investment fund uh, for the post crisis uh, period. Um, so as of the, today, uh, Poland has a little less than 2,650 cases with 45 deaths. Um, this is relatively low level um, so far, and. It, might be partially contributed to relatively fast decision to lock down the country and to introduce uh, strict border controls, but also um, by uh, introducing other measures uh, that uh, virtually lock down the whole country um, with closures of schools, universities, restaurants, and all non-essential businesses. Um, but uh, as it was already said, Poland is rather at the beginning of the outbreak, so the situation must be monitored further and um, uh, there might be some more cases uh, well definitely there will be more cases coming on so so um so um, it's it's too early to say where in the cycle poland is right now and going forward uh, as 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 i think about the, the region more generally um, I think there is a scope for a closer cooperation between the countries in Central Eastern Europe, especially right now. One of one of the issues are the emergency purchases, so to provide a, a, a bigger uh, purchasing power for the region, the coordinated action could be um, um, enacted by the governments to 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 provide those emergency uh, needs. But also, uh, it's time to think about the post post crisis. Uh, Landscape and and some measures um, could be um, uh, fought at at this time to to be prepared for for the moment when when crisis ends. That would be uh, everything from my side so far. Perfect, thank you. So let me just ask you one more question before we we turn to one of our other colleagues. How do you think what Poland is seeing right now will impact the EU, particularly when it comes to closing borders that we've seen? Uh, right, so um, it's it's really very hard to predict anything at the current juncture. Uh, there are too many variables, and the situation is very dynamic uh, currently. So, so I, I I would hesitate to 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 make any projection at, at this point. And I'm sorry for this. I I would be happy to discuss this issue maybe a little bit later on. Of course, it's hard to tell where this is going. Of course, thank you, Pieter. Dr. Benk, I'd love to turn to you now. You are IMF Alternate Executive Director for Hungary, Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, among many other countries. What does the situation look like in Central Europe from your perspective? Are there any countries or sectors of these economies that will be more affected than others? Good morning. Um, yeah, Central Europe uh, has some specific characteristics. Uh, mo most of the economies are small open economies, uh, of course, of a different degree, but still. Uh, and and the, the more open a country is, the more dependent is on, on the inputs, on the supply, supply chains, and it's more dependent on exports, on the external demand. And the more you export to, country, to countries affected more by the epidemic, the slower is the recovery. 
Now we have some good news, I think, from China, who is recovering, but, but still uh, we don't have much information on, on Europe. Now, Central Europe is um, very integrated, and in particular Hungary is very integrated in the German, German supply chain. But we are also exposed to China, not necessarily directly, but also indirectly through, through, through Germany. Uh, also, in the region, the tourist sector is, sector is uh, quite quite significant, and is a significant car industry. Now, uh, turning to Hungary, Hungarian auto industry is, is very significant, but I would say it's a little bit in a better situation because the Hungarian manufacturers uh, operate in the premium segments and and. Uh, and in the during the global financial crisis, uh, the sec the premium segment proved to be more resilient. However, this might not be the case with other uh, countries in the region. Now, one other specific thing in the region that I want to highlight is the is the labor market. So the, the labor market, and in general in Europe, the labor market is much different from the US. It is it is, is less way less flexible. So and once it is hit, the recovery is is much 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 more difficult. So, so basically, what is a what is the biggest disaster to a family? If it is if the primary earner earner loses his job, and that's why the, the main fo the main uh, focus of the Hungarian government is uh, to protect lives and protect the workplaces. And uh, why I am saying this? Uh, so this 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 crisis is is very special. It's uh, not a traditional one. This is something we have never seen before. And here we face both demand and supply shocks at the same same time at the same time. And we need, we have some experience how to handle the demand uh, shocks. This is what we had during the previous crisis, but. But now we have to tackle the supply side of the economy and we are in rather than uncharted water. We have less, less experience with this. I mean, we know the direction, but maybe we have less experience how to make the measures more targeted or as targeted as possible and as effective as possible. But the goal here is to, to prevent excessive economic disruption. So we want to preserve as much as possible the pre-crisis stages of the economy to preserve the product productive capacities. It's like taking a snapshot and then stop the clock, stop the time, and create a restore point in the economy. Well, this is not, not easy, but, uh, but this is uh, in general the goal. Now, turning to, to Hungary, um, I would say Hungary is, even within Central Europe, is a relative good situation because the economic fundamentals now are, are very strong. So the country is resilient. The GDP growth has been among the highest in the EU. Employment rate increased significantly during the past years and unemployment is now among the lowest in the EU. Households have a strong financial position, are less vulnerable. There is fiscal discipline, there are fiscal buffers, and the structure of the public debt is, is, is a very good because that has been the one of the strategies of the government to, to, to uh, try to, uh, not just try to, but, but to reduce the share of non-residents and the share of FX denominated debt. This, so that by this, by by today, the, the the structure of the public debt has been transformed to a more significant uh, extent. Uh, okay. Great, thank you. So let me ask you one more question then. Can you talk a little bit about how the impact of the coronavirus on Central Europe might be different from that what we're seeing in Western Europe? Just as what I mentioned before, Europe, Central Europe has a very significant tourism sector. For example, in Hungary, it represents like 13% of the economy, but in other countries, it's, it's even much more, much higher. We have a big auto industry. 
this is traditionally uh, affected, you know, from the past crisis. And, uh, and there is some heterogeneity among the countries in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the buffers, in terms of the um, uh, fundamentals, uh, and especially this heterogeneity is, is more highlighted, especially among uh, non-EU members of, of the region. Uh, and we know already by today that most of these non-EU non members of non-EU countries of Central Europe uh, have already uh, came to the to the IMF uh, uh, for assistance. Um, so um, this, this is what I what I can highlight about the region. Great, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bank. Mr. Rashkovan, you are IMF Alternate Executive Director for Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania, and several other countries. What impact will the coronavirus have from what you can see in your perspective, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania? You know, thanks, thanks for organizing and, and meet, uh, this meeting and also inviting. Our constituency really represents 15 European and Caucasus countries. And today I may speak here about four of them you know, two Central European countries, which are members of EU, which is Bulgaria and Romania, and two post-CIS countries, which is Moldova and my native country, Ukraine. You know, first, uh, what we have in common in, in all these four countries is uh, that the COVID crisis uh, substantially affects the economies in an unprecedented manner, but still with high uncertainty of the outcomes uh, and spillover effects. Uh, but what we also see is that the, the country authorities, which means central banks, governments, parliaments, uh, in a pretty determined way address the, the crisis. Uh, plus, uh, you know, the, the, the countries have a long standing tradition that the private sector also to share burdens of the, <clears throat> of the crisis effects. So it seems that uh, everybody has a skin in the game. You know, as Dr. Bianca uh, outlined in, in his speech, uh, you know, our four countries are also comparatively small, open, and also all uh, import dependent economies, uh, which uh, truly saying is in favor of uh, uh, the, uh, this time during this crisis. Having said that, you know, the, the new crisis hits all for economies through the usual channels. For example, for all our countries, remittances play an important role. For example, in Ukraine, remittances is about 11% of GDP, in Bulgaria is about 10% of GDP. So no calculations yet for the potential loss of remittances, uh, but the possible huge loss is clear since many workers have already returned from Italy, Spain, Poland, the UK. And uh, from another side, people actually moving back from those countries, uh, and this should also stimulate the local consumption or in local demand, at least in the short run. You know, Many affected industries, as also Mr. Dr. Ben said, uh, are the same like in many other countries. Tourism and travel are affected. For example, in Bulgaria, uh, tourism is, uh, is about 10% of GDP and about 30% decline in 2020 is expected. The, the effects for hotels and restaurants uh, is not clear yet since, since it really depends on the shock, uh, the shock duration. And also, outer party industry is affected due to the, the, the case that most of the EU supply chains have already been closed. But countries have also its own peculiarities or distinguished features, uh, which make the difference in responding to the, the COVID crisis. For example, the EU funds are available for two of our countries, uh, and they will be redistributed according to the extraordinary commission guidance to strengthen the healthcare sector or assist small and medium business. Uh. Ukraine so far may rely only on the macro financial assistance agreed with the European Commission, which is also tightened to the IMF program. Another difference, for example, is that uh, uh, the currency board in Bulgaria, which excludes all, any monetary response from the package of the crisis. But speaking more about the uh, more specifics about the countries, you know, Bulgarian authorities have already identified uh, the priorities and responded uh, accordingly. You know, in the banking sector, which is mostly foreign owned is very liquid and very well regulated and supervised because of the ERM2 project. Uh, nevertheless, its capitalization and especially liquidity have been strengthened by, by mobilization of additional like 500 million euro. And the Bulgarian Development Bank, uh, which is the only state bank uh, in Bulgaria, had been recapitalized by the government by 250 million euro to provide the guarantees to the small and medium business uh, and support them. 
My understanding is that the central bank is going to relax the, the prudential and supervisory framework soon, uh, fully in line with EBA guidance. Yeah, and the uh, government also committed to some extra spending of 500 million euro to preserve employment and increase the target of social assistance. And I, I, I fully share the, the view of Dr. Bank that uh, the most affected are the families and, uh, and the labor markets are pretty complicated and recovery will be pretty, pretty harsh in future. In Romania, I, I think the, the, the colleague from the ministry may comment further, you know, but uh, the state emergency declared on March 16th for a month, uh, and so pretty much everything is affected. Uh, it's hard to speak much uh, about the forecast, uh, uh, especially for growth and deficits, uh, uh, since uh, these figures are, you know, dominated by uncertainty. And everything depends on the duration of lockdown. But uh, the, the fiscal, the package of fiscal measures uh, of uh, about two percent of GDP has been adopted, uh, and this is uh, also to, to support the, uh, I mean, to pay the about 50, 75 percent of the uh, wages of all workers uh, temporarily unemployed, uh, and, and it's capped with uh, 75 percent of the average wage. Uh, and also the, the guarantees to the SME business uh, will be provided to a total amount about uh, 2.5 uh, uh, billion dollars. Uh, also, central bank acts uh, pretty, pretty, um, you know, in a determined way, uh, and also works on uh, to, to exercise flexibility on the capital buffers and liquidity ratios, etc. More, more measures are expected soon. Uh, mainly, um, uh, a lot to be adopted by the by the parliament uh, to postpone for nine months the payments of monthly loan payments to all debtors, subject for sure for their for their request. Moldova uh, also declared the state of national emergency and imposed restrictions on border crossing, like many other countries, and also limited the economic and social activity. Exports and the remittances are declining, as I said. Uh, and also with uh, some pressure on the change rate. Uh, what we see is that the central bank uh, stands ready, you know, to, to intervene in the FX market and to smooth the excessive exchange rate volatility if necessary. You know, comprehensive fiscal package, package is yet to be formulated uh, and voted by the parliament, uh, but several targeted fiscal measures to support business have been already announced by the authorities. For example, delaying tax payment deadlines to mid-2020 or suspending tax audits and other controls. This is, by the way, in, in many countries, uh, the authorities go to this kind of deregulation somehow. And finally, on Ukraine, as any other open economy, Ukraine may be also hit by the crisis, and it's expected that the uh, pandemic will reach its peak in the next uh, one, two months, uh, causing an economic contraction. Also linked to the uh, contraction in the export, uh, in the main uh, Ukrainian export uh, partners. It's also expected to drop uh, on uh, export import prices, which will affect also the, the, the GDP and truly saying relatively limited decline in local consumption. And while the, the, the COVID diagnosed uh, people is still comparatively low, the parliament, government, and central bank reacted uh, with several policy actions. Uh, and um, the, the, the parliament already uh, approved two, two economic packages despite the quarantine. So they, don't, uh, they didn't meet, but they met for the extraordinary meetings. Uh, and all these packages uh, are aimed at supporting the economy. So it's um, exempt all individual entrepreneurs from payroll tax for, for two months, abolished fines on businesses uh, for missed tax payments, uh, cancel tax inspections, uh, uh, for people, uh, uh, there is no fines for delays in utility payments, uh, uh, and more people became eligible for the uh, for, for the subsidies. Uh, uh, there are also uh, unemployment benefits for workers who temporarily lost their jobs, uh, and uh, the, there are many things which simplify the, the distant work uh, regulation for distant work. You know, uh, Parliament also cancelled the, the rent payments uh, for business and able to operate uh, on, during the quarantine and offered uh, some small and medium business support uh, under several government programs. On top of that, NBU, you know, also reduced, the National Bank reduced also the key rate and uh, looks ready probably to repeat it uh, during the next Monetary Policy Committee. And uh, also supported, uh, and do also supported uh, the FX market with regular interventions uh, and enhanced bank supervision. 
but also delayed the stress test 2021 and also the introduction of the new capital buffers. You know, compared to the previous crisis of 2008 or 2014, Ukraine seems you know better prepared or better positioned to withstand this shock. And uh, I personally think that uh, uh, given its uh, limited fiscal space uh, to support the economy, uh, you know, the government rightly focuses on, uh, on private individuals and small and med medium business. So maybe to sum up here is, uh, you know, to rephrase uh, the Tolstoy is uh, happy countries are all alike. Uh, every affected country by COVID is unhappy by its own way. But uh, IMF st stands ready to support all the countries that need it. Thanks. Thank you. And we're already getting some questions from the audience in our chat function directed to the IMF. So we'll come back to those in just a minute. We just had uh, Dr. Florin Vodita actually from the World Bank join us. So maybe if I can ask uh, Dr. Vodita to join us briefly to speak to some of the things that Mr. Rashkavan just mentioned and some of our other IMF colleagues just mentioned. Um, you are IMF director, uh, sorry, World Bank director for the Netherlands constituency, including Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Romania, Ukraine, and several other countries. So Dr. Vodita, are you are you there? Perfect. Yes, I'm here. Happy to see you. The situation for, uh, for, for from your perspective and what you're seeing based on the region countries that you cover? Now, I, I think we all agree the, uh, that we are no longer in a business as usual scenario and we live exceptional and challenging times. <clears throat> um, I'm looking more uh, at a less uh, a dynamic picture. First, uh, um, measures taken by uh, various governments to uh, confine, contain, and fight the spread of the virus. Now, what is uh, probably, in my, in, in my view, typical for Central and Eastern Europe is that they, um, the virus arrived like a week or two later compared to Western Europe because of the economic migration. For instance, we have well, one and a half million uh, Romanians in Italy, one million in Spain. Many of them returned to the country, uh, bringing, uh, of course, the virus as an alternative method to, uh, <clears throat> to infect the country as well, not from uh, tourism and other, and other visitors. Uh, so um, I expect uh, the peak of uh, the crisis to take place in my country, at least in Romania, uh, a week or two later compared to the Western uh, European countries. Uh, also, uh, the, the second phase would be uh, to look at the, um, at the economic uh, measures so that the recovery will be swift and less painful. Uh, now we have several scenarios and uh, we're happy to learn from other countries' experience uh, what is best to have uh, harsh measures for a short time or to extend and uh, maintain the economy uh, at a survival limit uh, but extending the, um, the, uh, the effect of, of the crisis overall. But I think we, we will go in line with other countries around us and also in the, uh, in the EU. And by the way, I think this is the right moment for the EU to, to show true leadership, true commitment and uh, partnership and team spirit to all the uh, EU member states. And I'm sure they are not going to fail this exercise, which is probably the, the most challenging uh, um, <coughs> um, exercise they, uh, the European Union ever lived together after the Second World War. Now, uh, the third uh, point would be uh, the debt management. Now, uh, countries may be happy to, to accept uh, loans for the time being, but if we look at the future um, foreign debt, uh, the, uh, the debt management uh, also needs uh, a lot of attention so that it doesn't backfire after a year or two when the uh, economy starts uh, uh, leaving again and providing the, uh, the country uh, the, need, the resources it needs uh, so that we can go back to um, not to the best practice we used to have like uh, 3% in the uh, European Union but at least to, to show a, a, a growth and uh, to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that light should not be the train coming towards us, it should be uh, the sun shining in, in, our, in our future. Um, 
I think partnership in these times of crisis, um, sharing uh, general practice, best practice uh, is is vital. And uh, we are working on that in, in my constituency where I'm alternate executive director. And we, we have uh, daily office meetings, we share, we, uh, we are trying to see uh, the uh, solutions in this huge puzzle. But for the time being, um, I think, um, each country, each government uh, took the necessary measures according to their own specific uh, conditions. I'm happy to take any other questions if you have any. Perfect. It looks like you have some questions coming in from the audience, but I will bring those back at the very end. So thank you, Dr. Rodita. I'll now turn to our colleagues from the Romanian and Czech governments for their view. Secretary Burduja, you're a state secretary in the Ministry of Public Finance of Romania. How is Romania handling this crisis? And what steps should the governments of Central Europe be taking to minimize the damage to their economies and accelerate or help accelerate recovery? Well, first of all, thank you kindly for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, uh, in the company of Atlantic Council uh, Networks. I'm also a Millennium Fellow, so I love being part of this network and um, obviously serving in my current role. Um, if you allow me, I will just start with a bit of a broader context. And uh, I heard somebody else uh, quote from uh, Václav Havel. I would like to quote Ronald Reagan, who said that uh, the government's first duty uh, is to protect the people, not to run their lives. And uh, frankly, I'm quite worried, you know, even beyond economics, uh, about certain um, public messages out there that praise uh, authoritarian regimes, illiberal regimes that appear to have weathered this crisis better than democracies. I think it's a huge threat to uh, economies, but also our livelihoods. So I think it's important to save our lives, but also save our souls uh, beyond this crisis. Um, second of all, I fully agree that, uh, you know, we need integrated solutions. Uh, we cannot discuss of a Romanian solution, a Hungarian solution, uh, Bulgarian solution, etc. Uh, we need solutions at the level of the European Union. And it is indeed uh, a time for the EU to shine and demonstrate uh, that that it can uh, help member states. So we very much welcome the fact that the Commission, for instance, uh, created a more flexible framework for state aid schemes. Uh, and we're about to take advantage of that. I think there have been about 20 state aid schemes submitted so far. Romania is preparing a couple of those as well. Um, also, the EIB is preparing a pan-European uh, guarantee fund. We'll see how that is funded itself. But we welcome those uh, European solutions because, frankly, look at it from our perspective, 80% uh, of Romania's exports are to other EU member states. Uh, Germany is 22%. Uh, then comes, I believe, Italy, then France. There, there, can be, there cannot be uh, solutions um, independent of what uh, Europe as a whole uh, does to weather this uh, unprecedented crisis. In terms of what we've done so far um, at the national level, we obviously want to protect people's livelihoods, uh, save as much of their income as possible. We cover 75% of um, uh, people's income if their uh, workplace has been directly or indirectly affected by the uh, pandemic. Um, also, uh, we have postponed uh, the uh, loan payments that both individuals and companies have up to nine months. Uh, in terms of businesses, obviously liquidity is a huge concern, so we're trying to facilitate access to uh, cheap loans. Essentially, the state guarantees uh, up to 90% of uh, small, medium-sized enterprises loans and uh, fully subsidizes uh, the interest. Essentially, it's a 0% uh, interest uh, rate loans. Uh, we're also in the process of uh, designing sectoral aid schemes, for instance, for the transportation sector, which has taken a huge uh, hit, as in any other country. And um, beyond all this, I would, I would just uh, close my intervention with this thought that beyond what happens now, we're looking at how the world post-coronavirus will look like and how we as a country, as a region, as Europe can stay competitive uh, in that world. So I'll try to end on an optimistic note and say, uh, 
you know, every crisis is an opportunity. And for Romania, this uh, this crisis uh, is an opportunity to um, accelerate uh, going digital, especially for large parts of government. We've already been forced to adapt and uh, be a lot more digital than before. And I think we can take that further, both in the public sector and in the private sector. Uh, I know Spain has uh, a government program that uh, puts uh, basically grants into companies that go digital faster. Uh, we also have a government program, by the way, uh, for companies that have adapted their production to uh, uh, produce uh, masks, uh, uh, special equipment needed for the current crisis. And I think that's that will go on. Um, and, uh, you know, we also have an opportunity in terms of the diaspora coming back. Uh, several hundred thousand Romanians have returned from Western Europe. And uh, surely they can be seen as a burden on our social uh, safety systems. But I think we need to look at it as an opportunity and find the ways that we can uh, leverage this um, this uh, labor force in the new economy. Uh, people are typically happy to be back. Uh, we just need to find the right jobs and to put them back to work. So, and the last thing I'll say is um, obviously for countries like Romania, a lot of Eastern Europe, um, we welcome the idea of a Marshall Plan. We've heard this uh, uh, mentioned out there. Uh, a lot of investment in infrastructure. We think uh, that by by pumping a lot of money into highways, bridges, um, energy, et cetera, we can indeed uh, create the prospects for healthier, uh, stable growth in the future and put people back to work uh, in the short term. Uh, but uh, indeed, the Marshall Plan relied on a, on a relatively united Europe uh, and also on a strong leadership by the U.S. So we welcome American leadership, and we think we need uh, more than that. Um, we need it more than ever today. So thank Great. you. Thank you so much. Ms. Bartanova, you're director of the Department of the Americas in the Czech Ministry of Industry and Trade. So let me turn to you for your perspective from the Czech Republic. How are you and your government dealing with the spread, and how are supply chain, particularly, and innovation being affected by the crisis from your view? Yes, uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, this has been quite an unfortunate, obviously, but also interesting time to say so. The Czech economy, like most economies that were mentioned here, is a small one and an open one. And we were entering the current crisis uh, with the lowest unemployment in the EU. Um, so our economy was going fast. It was almost overheating. And now we're seeing how to keep it afloat. Um, currently, the Czech Republic has roughly 3,600 people with the coronavirus that have been diagnosed and um, almost 40 deaths. Um, there was a very swift lockdown and very swift measures that were adopted by our government. Uh, so that has allowed us to contain the pan pandemic to a manageable extent. However, we still don't know how uh, the pandemic will proceed. And uh, for now, we do have the national emergency going till mid-April, and there is a discussion about prolonging it actually for another month. What is important for the economy is obviously what's happening everywhere. The streets are empty. Um, kids were in the first place sent back home from schools. So uh, that has withdrawn a lot of the workforce uh, from the companies. We have had certain companies closing down. Some are actually keeping production. However, um, they are still trying to get their supplies of masks, disinfectants, and so on. Uh, we have had some major producers like the Škoda Auto and other automotive producers uh, close down for a considerable amount of time. Um, so that is obviously going to impact our economy um, statistically and also in the long run. Um, for now, the government is trying to adopt some progressive measures to try to cut down the time that we need to manage this. We are considering a smart quarantine using um, data and um, kind of um, monitoring really the spread uh, through um, different technologies. So now there is actually a pilot project and we will see if this will be useful for the national level. However, obviously, to keep the economy going, there have been a lot of measures adopted so far. Um, some have been dedicated to companies themselves, but also for some self-employed people. And as was said before, the companies and the people are really at the core of the crisis and we need to help them survive it economically and also in health. Um, so we have had measures um, like 
have, I think most of them have actually been mentioned here. Um, people can um, ask for loan deferrals or mortgage deferrals. Uh, we are not sanctioned if we don't submit our um, taxes uh, on time. Uh, there are available loans for companies, uh, especially small and medium companies, uh, that are easily accessible. And there are also compensations for companies that have been uh, hurt uh, by the current situation. So um, these measures are being adopted um, pretty much step by step, uh, according to how the situation has been progressing. But the idea is really to avoid some major catastrophe in terms of our production. Um, we will see how this is really affecting different sectors. It has been mentioned here, the automotive, the aerospace, you name it, we have those sectors. They are really the cornerstone of our production and of our industry. And they are globalized and uh, they are currently, you know, kind of in a standstill. Um, we have the automotive in the Czech Republic forms about 9% of our GDP, 80% of it is exported. And one of our major partners is actually Germany. So in the recovery time, we will depend highly on how other countries are doing as well and how our supply, cha supply chains are actually coming in. Um, this will be, in my opinion, a major challenge. And I also think that um, the future, which is uncertain, will might force us to actually diversify even a little more our exports. Although we have been doing that so far, this might be another push to do so. I think that we will have to heavily look into um, technologies and R&D. The government has been supporting that. We have formed special programs that encourage companies to actually produce new technologies for uh, the coronavirus issues and um, also, there's been cooperation with research organizations. So that's definitely one part. These technological solutions can be shared with other countries. Uh, we have shared our um, major respirator uh, invention that is 3D printed and the license is open uh, for others to use it. So all these are kind of the ground level initiatives that are happening everywhere and that might actually really benefit us. It was mentioned that digitalization is receiving another major push uh, during this time. We have seen that increasingly um, that where it seemed that it was difficult to digitalize, all of a sudden it's happening really fast in terms of days. So I think there will be actually some maybe hopefully even positive changes that we might work with in the future. Um, and that also brings me to certain risks because these decisions can be made fast, but also we need to be sure that the data is protected, that uh, this doesn't lead to control that wouldn't be reversible. Uh, we want to make sure that our societies remain open and uh, remain secure. Um, so there needs to be a certain balance uh, in terms of that. Um, however, it's really, too early to see uh, what our economy will look like at the end of this and what the end of the tunnel, as Sosa said, uh, will be. Uh, there will be for sure new supply chains. Uh, currently, there's initiatives in different sectors of companies that haven't previously worked together. And just because they are facing issues, they are finding new partners right now to make sure that they produce supplies and protective gear that will help the locals and the citizens and possibly export in the future. So um, we see that really the economy is completely restructuring and we will see how that goes. But for now, for the government, it's really important that we keep the economy afloat, that we make sure that there is no unnecessary bankruptcies in companies that were doing well before the crisis, and that the citizens really have the necessary safety net and protection that they need. Thank you. Thank you so much. 3D printed respirators, that's a great thing. Hopefully more will take that up if it's an open license. So I'll now turn to our colleagues from GlobeSec and the Atlantic Council before we open it up to questions. So Sonia, you're chief economist at the GlobeSec Policy Institute. Can you speak a little bit more to the situation in Slovakia? Has the economic impact also been uniform across the region or are there regional differences that we should be looking at? And lastly, what's the long-term impact in your opinion? Okay, thanks Denise and hello everyone. Um, so, I mean, a short response is, I think it's evident by now that we're in for a pretty epic crisis here, and this is in the CE region or outside of it. As it's been said, it's a real economic crisis, unlike the previous one, it's fueled by simultaneous shocks on both supply and demand sides. 
Um, as for CEE, the containment measures uh, which have been already discussed and are um, pretty similar across the board with some uh, slight differences in configurations. Um, they will impair both lives of the regional economy in the sense that um, they will act on the domestic side. So um, household consumption, which has been a dependable source of growth in CEE in the past decade will be impaired and obviously also the external like, which is the conventional industries that we've already uh, discussed and that have traditionally provided a backbone to the economy. Uh, needless to mention that economies like Slovakia are tightly woven and knit in global value chains. So even after a comeback, um, there might be a further effect of getting these existing global chains intact and operational. But I want to talk a little bit um, about short-term versus long-term impacts. So I think for now, and especially for the upcoming three months for the upcoming quarter, we as a region need to brace for a deep dive and accept that social distancing measures will inevitably translate into a um, massive economic dislocation and across the board in services, in consumption of goods on the production side. Um, and in the meantime, basically policy throughout the region should focus on what, what, what it has been already said on implementing measures that minimize fallout on two things, on employment and on firms going under, firms going bust. Like we're, we're basically switching to a low grade of the economy, but we need the economy to uh, be operational on this low grade to keep on running. Um, so if the region can somehow manage this, um, and I would also love to see more cooperation to that end, uh, more fiscal cooperation, because it may have some synergic effects, some reinforcement effects. Um, that would be great. Uh, but it's also important to look beyond the three-month frame at the longer-term picture. So basically, COVID, COVID hits at the time when CEE um, has had one of the longest expansions, but also its economic tailwinds are waning, right? So we need industry upgrades, um, labor costs are um, have gone up, EU funds support is um, fizzling, um, and also the, the CE, uh, CE economy, excuse me, is um, overly reliant on, on manufacturing, and that's a risky business, especially in today's uh, climate. Um, so I think COVID has further um, highlighted some of these economic shortcomings, and this will get me back full circle to what has been said already. Um, we really perceive the region's underdeveloped digital infrastructure. Uh, we see a small number of businesses with online presence. We see late cancelled orders. We see shortages, which admittedly also is due to uh, disruptions uh, on an international level in supply chains, but also it might have to do with poor inventory management of businesses. And we also see a lot of local businesses hit hard because of no contingency planning geared towards being operational without physical presence of workers. So I think all of these, all of these developments will have a lasting consequences on the region, on business models, on supply chains. Um, and future work, also future of work in CEE also. So I think um, I have to join the others in uh, ending on an optimistic uh, note that there is a silver lining to this. And for example, China managed to transform its uh, dormant e-commerce sector after the, after the SARS uh, epidemic in 2003. And I think this is an opportunity uh, above all for the region to start laying its, the groundwork for a new economic chapter. And I, I don't think it's uh, just an option anymore. I think it's a fundamental question of survival. So I will, I'll just stop there. Great, thank you. I appreciate ending on a positive note. Ben, let me turn to you very quickly as well. You and Josh actually just published a piece on how Europe's economic emergency is also a geopolitical one. And others have talked about the opportunities, which is one thing that you've highlighted. What is the geopolitical challenge that we're facing and what's the long-term impact? What are the opportunities? Yeah, yeah hi, and thanks Denise, and, and I'm really glad to be part of this terrific conversation. Very briefly, and sort of sum up our argument with, with Josh, you know, uh, the Eurozone is, is going through uh, a debate over its response to the, the current uh, economic shock linked to uh, the coronavirus. 
uh, as, as the U.S. is as well. And there's been a lot of debates about, you know, integrating further um, the eurozone and, and maybe common borrowing through corona bonds or euro bonds. Um, and and what, what Josh and I try to do is, is give some strategic and geopolitical context to this conversation that is mostly about e- economics. And I think one of the main things that we, we try to do is, is, is compare with the 2008 crisis. You know, um, it, it's very important, and, and, and I've heard this before in, in this great conversation, people saying this is not business as usual, the world is changing, and even it, it's different than the 2008 crisis. First, the economic shock might be deeper and stronger than in 2008, but I think there are two main uh, differences that we wanted to underline. The first one is the external asymmetric nature of, of, of the shock. You know, you can't point to uh, countries that have uh, poorly managed their budgets or that are responsible for, for the impact. This is a crisis that is touching uh, every European country equally. Some have responded better than others. Some have uh, more widespread testing or have uh, uh, imposed uh, social isolation earlier, but but it has nothing to do with, with public finance. I think this is why you know it, it's critical to have European solidarity in, in the response to this. And, and the second really critical uh, uh, difference that is sort of missing from the conversation is, is the geopolitical uh, um, uh, environment. Uh, that is different from 2008, that is to a certain extent a consequence of 2008. Rising populist nationalist forces in Europe, uh, uh, you know, and, and Eurosceptic forces. Uh, unfortunately, a U.S. administration that is more inward looking and, and less prone to, to leading a global and international response to, uh, to this, although this, this might change in the next days and weeks. Um, and, and, and obviously authoritarian models, China and Russia, uh, that are more assertive in trying to promote an alternative model. And we've seen this in, in Europe with a lot of propaganda, a lot of disinformation and fake news, but also a, a real challenge to, to Europeans and to translating solidarity with, with Russians and Chinese also stepping up with uh, delivering masks, delivering tests in, in Italy and, and elsewhere. And I think th- this, is, this, is, this really goes to the core of the, the challenge for European citizens. And, and, and this, you know, this just leads me to say that I do think that Central and Eastern European countries, including those that are not uh, members of, of the Eurozone and, and that, that are not directly part of this conversation, have a critical role to play uh, because they understand this geopolitical challenge. They understand the rise of these authoritarian models and, and uh, the, the, how it could divide and disunite the, uh, the European Union. And so I think you know, countries like Poland and others can, can really step up. And, 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 you know, as Piotr and others have said earlier, they are actually doing a, a very good job at dealing with this uh, internally. But I think they also have a voice uh, for other Europeans uh, to, to say, look, this is, you know, this is also a strategic challenge for European power. This is, you know, a, a challenge for us to show our citizens that, uh, that we can react to this better than, than countries, than authoritarian models like, like China and, and Russia. So I think this is why it's so important to have this conversation today and, and, and to really mix it with also the, uh, the foreign policy dimension. Thank you, Ben. I know some of our panelists had to drop off, but to all of you remaining, I just want to ask a few of the questions from the audience before we have to end. One of them is, would you assume that the COVID-19 pandemic will cause states to look to replace China in terms of global and regional supply chains? A, a second question from the audience has been, to what extent Can the EU Green Deal act as an economic stimulus package? And another question we have that I'd like any of you to speak to, how will Brexit impact the recovery of Britain and the economies across Europe, including Central Europe? So I open the floor to to our speakers. Maybe Sonia or some of our representatives from Romania or the Czech Republic, could you speak to those? Yeah, um, if I may, I can uh, offer my perspective on replacing China in global value chains. So I think there is no universal answer to that. Uh, This uh, varies by industry. It might be the case in some industries, it might not in others. But I think the general trend that we will see more and more of is regionalization of supply chains, if you will. So basically the supply chains won't be spread as thin um, across the globe because that's becoming more and more risky. And this is something that has started even before COVID with trade wars, with you know rising nationalism, with, with Brexit, um, with, with other trends that we've seen on a geopolitical um, scene. So I, I think it's also um, important that 
some businesses are closer to their target consumers. So that's also one factor that, that plays into the overall picture. But yeah, the bottom line is that we will see more supply chains going uh, regional. I think that's what we're going to see more of. Thank you. Uh, if I may, just quickly on the Green Deal. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about that before. Much of this uh, has gone uh, on and uh, it's probably going to need some adjustment. I think it's it could be seen as part of a solution to stimulate the economy and uh, invest in uh, much needed solutions for us. But frankly, it we feel that it, it has to be more customized to what each country needs. Uh, the 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 needs of a country like Romania and other countries in the region are different than the needs of France, Germany, uh, and so on and so forth. But we expect to see um, progress there, and um, uh, you know, hopefully, the the Green Deal will allow us to invest more in hard infrastructure uh, that obviously contributes to the uh, climate goals. But uh, as it stands now, as it stood before this whole crisis, it did not allow for much of those hard investments to take place. So hopefully this is an opportunity to improve it. Thank you. And to the IMF specifically, we have a question from the audience. Is the IMF prepared for any bailout situation concerning the impact of COVID-19? Uh, if, if I may speak, I, I don't think we are well positioned to answer this question right now. <laughs> Great, um, thank but you. We, we are we are definitely monitoring the situation, uh, looking into the um, economic developments in each country. And for all those who are interested in our work, I would highly recommend to um, to look at um, the tool that we developed called the Policy Tracker, uh, where you can find um, all the information about the policy measures that were implemented mm -hmm. by each country um, uh, that is an IMF member um, over the period of last two weeks, uh, and it is updated regularly. Great, thank you. Well, this about brings us to time. So thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we went a little bit over. It's great to have you all here. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy, and we look forward to organizing more of these specific conversations on the impact throughout Europe. Um, this region in particular is the engine of Europe, something that Josh mentioned, and it's very important to our work. So thank you all again for joining us and to our speakers, a special thank you for making the time to be with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.